Okay. So uh, welcome everybody. It's another AITA uh, free lecture. This time we have like super interesting topic. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about paleoparasitology and parasitology in general and why it's so important for, for archaeological context. And um, Aida will, uh, will give us an intro and also uh, what is really important for us uh, as if we are not into the Palopar's theology, but why it's really important to, to, to have this lecture is also is how we can help to, to Palopar's to gather the sample, because as we are going to see, it's uh, not always possible. At least I don't think there's a more, how many of you are in total in the world? I think not more than 20 or something like that, right? <laughs> no, it's a very small yeah. field. <laughs> yeah, so it's impossible to have always one paleoparasitologist on, on the site. So it's really important that at least we, when we are digging, uh, we can collect samples, recognize samples, recognize the things that that can belong to uh, to parasites like the the, the cyst and non calcified cyst and similar. So it's really uh, it's one very interesting topic because uh, human health is very. Uh, closely connected to to the to par parasites and our um, uh, coexistence, but also on the other hand is also how to to improve our digging and our results. So either whenever you you can, you can start sharing the screen, yes. and, and okay. I'm looking forward to to hear you. And yeah. uh, now, oops, you should see it. Yeah, we can see the presentation. You can see the fire move as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. So, so yeah, as Natasha was saying, um, what I've been thinking about for today, because I don't know, like, if you are biologists, if you have any any training in parasitology, if you know anything about about parasites at all or what we do, what we can learn. What I thought about for this presentation is just to, to throw at you a, a bunch of case studies. So we have a, a global vision of what archaeoparasitology is and then and what we can learn from, from it, what insights we get, what research questions we can pose to archaeoparasitology. And, and then like as Natasha said, just give the last few minutes of this of this course to techniques in the field because archaeoparasitology begins in the field, and we like if we are aware of the questions we can ask to it, then we can we can plan for it ahead. And as as Natasha said, we are not a lot of people doing parasites, but if we all work together to in order to get good samples the work can start like start broadening and going like um like broadening the research and getting more and more people involved even though they may not be um parasitologists i use the word archaeoparasitology because i think it 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 emphasizes the fact that we rely on archaeological methods and archaeological data and archaeological perspectives. But paleoparasitology is a widely used um, word. It's a widely used um, concept as well. I think archaeoparasitology also um, includes uh, paleoparasitology, which has like a connotation of just looking at the past, um, like at, at the ancient origins of of parasites, but um, I'm happy with paleoparasitology. So, so don't worry if like um, I may I may change both. I may go from archaeoparasitology to paleoparasitology to parasitology alone, but I'm referring to the same. Um, just before we start, and because this is being recorded, um, in terms of images, all the images have been credited. If not, the that means that they are public domain or that I've obtained them under license from Shutterstock and other places with high resolution images. Other images are mine. So if ever you want to, to reproduce the images, you are interested in them, just ask me, I can send them over to you. 
also because I am I am citing a lot of case studies. Most of them are not my case studies. Um, I I cite them. I sometimes use their images. I recommend you to go to the original sources. Most of the uh, papers I am citing, if not all of them, should be online free. So you don't need to have institutional access to get to them. So, so this should be pretty easy for you to access. So I think now we can start. And oh, oh, oh yes, if you want to, to stop me, if you want to ask me a question, um, I'm happy. I tend to speak a lot and, and very fast. So you can stop me, ask me questions, and we can go from there. I have no problem, and, and you don't have to wait to the end to, to, to raise your, your, your um, questions, okay? So to begin with, I wanted to start with the basics and what is archaeoparasitology. So archaeoparasitology in general tense is defined as the study as the study of parasite remains from archaeological sites. This includes identification of parasites and the study of their interactions with host vectors and environments. As I was saying, and as Natasha mentioned, as a science, archaeoparasitology relies on bioarchaeological data, paleopathology, and archaeology. But because um, archaeoparasitology, like paleopathology, the importance of archaeoparasitology relies in its capacity to create nuanced discourses about health, those discourses that are about health in the past, but also about health, public health today. Um, archaeoparasitology also um, connects with um, veterinary and clinical sciences, public health sciences, and even humanities. And because of these reasons, and because um, as parasitologists, we use a broad, a broad amount of sources, um, we, archaeoparasitology becomes a very, a very multidisciplinary science. And this is very important to understand um, that the, the multidisciplinarity of of archaeoparasitology and its impact in today's in today's um, thinking of health, because if you just go like if you just do a random search on Google, go top top neglected um, diseases today, you will see that that of all the listed of the 20, 22 listed neglected diseases, thirteen of them, thirteen. So that's more than half of them are of parasitic origin. So just thinking about that, we understand how, how important um, parasitology is, and how important it is to create these courses that help us understand parasites and parasitic infections today. So said that, let's, let's go a little bit on concept check, uh, what are parasites? Um, because when we talk about Parasitism, we normally talk about a type of relationship between organisms where one of them, the parasite, lives in or on the organism and derives nutrients from it. This organism um, that the parasite lives on or lives in is the host. Some parasites have super, super complicated, um, complex life cycles that require multiple hosts to develop and mature to adulthood. Others just need um, need of vectors to be transmitted from human to human or from animal to human or from human to animal. So we have different type of parasites. And because the definition is so ample, we are just talking, rather than, than talking about, about a, a group of a species or a group of, of uh, organisms, what we are talking when we talk about parasitism is more of a, an ecological concept, is a way of living. And some estimates think that parasitism is the way of living of over 50% of all living organisms on Earth. So it's a massive, massive group. So what 
do we refer to, like, what are we referring to when we refer to parasites as parasitologists? So we normally refer, refer to three types of parasites. First, ectoparasites. Ectoparasites that live on the surface of the host. And here I present you with Lucille. She is a bed bug. She was, um, she, she gave me hell for, she and her friends gave me hell for over three months when they lived under my bed. Um, bed bugs are an example of ectoparasites. Other uh, parasites are endoparasites. Endoparasites are parasites that live inside the host. Some types of parasites, some types of parasites are protozoa. Protozoa are single cell eukaryotic organisms. Here you have Entamoeba histolica are, and some others. And I think you will be more used to these type of parasites. Probably when you think about parasites, your mind goes to helminths. Helminths are worm-like parasites. So these um, crazy looking worms that inhabit inside, inside us normally in our gastrointestinal system. So, so normally we talk about, about this, in parasitology, we talk about these three types of parasites. So what I thought for this, for today, as I said, is just go um, case, case study by case study, and I'm going to try to do it in order by type of parasite. So let's just start with ectoparasites. Oops. Ectoparasites, as I was saying, are parasites that live outside of the host, generally on the skin or on the hair, but also in clothes, on, clothes, on the clothing that we wear. And most typical ectoparasites are tick, fleas, lice, parasitic mites, bed bugs like like my friend Lucille. So all of them like ten are very common in humans and we find them quite often in archaeology. Um, probably one of the most interesting um, ectoparasites is the human lice. And the human lice is interesting because it has a very host specific relationship with, with humans. So um, Human part, like the human lives, only infects, only infests human humans. So we have this this um this very um close relationship with with lies, and also they are very interesting because they have very specific ecological niches. So um, head lice live and breed at the base of the hair while body louse lives and breeds in the clothing that we wore, and they never exchange ecological niches. So this, this gives us a um, very interesting context to study them. And, and, and because they are the, the, we share this long history with them, we've been evolving in tandem with, with human lives, we can learn a lot about our own human evolutionary history, of our own human migrations out of Africa, but also about the evolutionary history of, of lies. So just to give you a couple of examples, phylogenetic analysis have determined that human lies and chimpanzee lies shared a common ancestor around 6 million years ago. So funny enough, um, this is the time that fossil record and molecular clock for, for humans tells us that we humans as, as species diverge from chimpanzees. So they, they match in this, in this phylogenetics. And then other interesting facts is that around 100,000 years ago, um, lies ex likes experience a demographic expansion, and this coincides with the uh, out of Africa, out of Africa migration of Homo sapiens. So we have yet another source 
to investigate human origins, to investigate human evolution. And we can do this through parasites. And this is, this is a venue that many archaeoparasitologists have taken to, to study um, parasitic relationships with humans. Um, here, what the images that you have, these are um, these have been taken by Carl Reinhardt and colleagues. This is a research that had, has been taken for over 20 years or 20 years now, and where they are studying um, specimens from prehistoric Andean populations. And what they are finding is that when they are doing um, molecular analysis on lice from pre-Columbian Andean populations, these lice are related to, to um, Africa, to old world lice. So that's showing us, um, showing us uh, that, uh, that this relationship between old world and new world and can potentially help us retrace the migrations and the peopling of the Americas. In this case, um, what you see here, these, these auto montages that you see here with needs and, and the lies and needs on the combs with hair found, found in the tombs. And these are taken from Chiribaya mummies. Um, this Chiriba from by, as I said, by Carl Reinhardt and colleagues. And for 20 years, they've been collecting information on head louse infestation. So this is head lice, not body lice, as I said, two different ecological niches. And they've concluded that lice were a definitely major annoyance among Chiribaya communities. And funny enough, adult men were often more affected than women and children. And this is, this is funny because today the, the, the group, the population group that is more affected by lies are children in schools and, and female children, like, like girls are, tend to be more, more annoyed by, by lies. And what they've been suggesting is that probably it has to do with, with um with the combing and hairstyles that Chiribaya people wore, men tended to have very intricate um, braided hairs, very tight, very clean, clean hairs. And this, these two, these two um, facts, the, the fact that they were tight, tightly braided, and the fact that they were very clean hairs made made of uh, made a perfect habitat for lice. So we, we see, we see uh, um, not only who was being affected by lice, but also the context and under which circumstances people were affected by lice. Lice have been, have been found almost in, every, in everywhere in the world, from Greenland to the, the Red Sea from 10,000 years ago to very recent times. And to that respect, it's very interesting the association between lies and epidemic crisis. For example, my colleague, Clotilde Rogers, here in, in Université Laval in Quebec, where I am, is, a is a studying at, at lies and in the context of epidemic crisis, the crisis of cholera and typhus that occurred in, in Quebec in, during the 19th century. So cholera first around 1930s and typhus after 1947, there were massive crises associated to, to massive migrations from mainly from Ireland to Quebec. Uh, due to the famine, to the great famine that took here in Ireland. And under this context, um, hospitals and cemeteries were being built here in Quebec. And this is very interesting because lies are not only, are not only um, parasites, but they can also be vectors for disease. And one of the uh, and one of the diseases that body lice can carry is the uh, the bacteria for typhus. 
finding them in this context of epidemic crisis where in places where we know that people were buried, um, where, where, that people were suffering from typhus and buried, can tell us a little bit about, about, um, about the, the impact that um, this crisis had and can tell us about, about the, the, the pathology at death of these people. In particular, these in these pictures that you are seeing here, these were retrieved from, from mass graves associated to, to a parish charge next to a hospital. And so I'm um, we although we don't know if these these particular cases, these lies in particular are head lies or body lies. They have a very similar morphology and we have not done DNA analysis to test um, to see if they had um, any any um, if they had traces of of the bacteria for typhus. They are already um, they are already showing us that that people were infested by lice, and from here we can go and just keep broadening our research. We can, as I say, we can do molecular analysis. We can test for for we can test for um, the, the bacteria for TFS. And uh, this, ha this has happened in other places. So Napoleonic um, in Vilnius, they did test um, soldiers from Napoleonic troops. They found them infested with body lice. And when they tested these body lice, they, they showed positive for both typhus and trench fever. So very interesting, very interesting um, insights that we can gain from this, this annoying ectoparasites, but very cute looking. Next, I, I would like to move to, the, uh, to another type of parasite, protozoa. The protozoa, as, uh, as I mentioned before, are eukaryote, one cell organisms that, that can free living that can be free living or parasitic. Here, what we are interested is in the parasitic uh, protozoa. Um, protozoa are some of the most widespread infections worldwide. For example, here you have a picture of Yarda, which is one of the most prevalent intestinal parasites in human. It is cosmopolitan and it's very common in children between six to 10 years of age. And it can cause severe intestinal disorders like diarrhea. It is also common among backpackers, so it's called the backpackers disease um, because we share we share um, toilet facilities, not always not always in optimal optimum hygienic conditions. So so protozoa are very very um, very um, prominent still today and can cause severe diseases, including um, we're talking when we talk about protozoparasite, we're talking about the malaria, we are talking about the sleeping sickness, leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, all diseases that cause high morbidity but also high mortality. And so so it's important that we look at them. Um, Protozoa, we don't find them in archaeology. We don't have traces of the parasite, but we can look at pathology caused by these parasites. And this is very interesting. And this is something that as archaeologists, we need to think about when we are looking at uh, diseases that, that sometimes we gain insights into, or like we can study parasitic diseases and this association between parasites and humans through pathology. So like this time reversing the order rather than from parasites to pathology, from pathology to parasite. This, this is like, this can be um, something very interesting for bioarchaeologists and paleopathologists out there. Um, just to give you a case study um, with my colleagues, we've been working in a publication that has been submitted now on the origin and evolutionary history of Trypanosoma cruzi and the emergence of Chagas disease in the Americas. Trypanosoma cruzi is this cute looking, do I have a pen, a pen here, a laser phone? 
this cute looking protozoan that causes Chagas disease. Um, Chagas disease is endemic in many South American countries, affects around 8 million people, and affects around 8 million people. And although it doesn't cause a lot of deaths, it is still a leading cause of death um, in South American countries. Ticrus eye is transmitted by this scary looking uh, triatomine or kissing bug. And, and although it has a very complex um, life cycle with some developmental stages on, on the back and some developmental stages on humans, we have a very good understanding of how the disease occurs. And it occurs when the, uh, the, triat the infected triatomine takes a blood meal on the human host. Um, normally this occurs at night and they are called kissing bugs because they tend to bite on the face of the human. And so it's like they, they are like coming at night, taking a bite. And when they take a bite, they normally defecate. And it's in their feces that the trypanosoma, that the trypanosoma is found. When we wake up in the morning with the itchiness of the bite, we tend to rub ourselves, scrub the, and inadvertently scrub the feces into the little wound left by the bite. And so that's how the trypanosoma can enter our, our system. They can enter, infect our, our muscular cells and then infect our bloodstream. Um, Chagas disease is mainly a disease, is primarily a disease that occurs in the wild and affects wild mammals, but there are variants today that only occur in domestic context, in domestic context, that means in rural areas and, but, and urban areas, areas where humans live. And for me and my colleagues, this was a very interesting question. When did it happen that this primarily wild disease moved to a, a disease of humans. And that's what we, we began like looking for. And to do so, we relied on, on research that has been ongoing for, for um, years and years. So beginning in the 1980s, Archaeologists working with pre-Columbian human remains, many of them mummies, began identifying pathologies related to chronic Chagas disease, like megacolon individuals. And megacolon is, means the cessation of bowel movements and enlargement of the colon, often accompanied by the accumulation of large masses of feces. So what you are seeing here is, is the pelvic girdle full of desiccated feces. That would be a pathology associated to Chagas disease is called megacolon. Um, first, so in the 90s, this research began and then through the 90s and 2000s, evidence kept piling and, and then we were able to use molecular techniques to identify if these were if these were actually individuals infected with Chagas disease, and what molecular analysis told us is that yes, um, most of these cases, all of these cases, not most, all of the cases identified as megacolon were cases of Chagas disease. But more than that, many other individuals that we had not identified as having Chagas disease were also infected with Chagas disease. And what um, molecular and paleopathology was able to say is that Chagas disease began as a human disease as early as the first humans settled in the region of, in the, mes in the Mississippi of, of the disease, disease in Chile, in the, in the, in the Pacific coast of Chile. And it dates to 9,000 years ago, to the period, to the Chinchorro period. So as soon as humans um, settled in the region, they began being infected 
with, with Chagas disease. And what's more, as evidence kept mounting, researchers realized that across all time periods until the arrival of the European colonizers, the prevalence of Chagas disease was of 40%. So from early times to colonizing time, to, to the colonization, like we have a high, high prevalence of Chagas disease. In our paper, what we try to investigate is, is to see, to see um, what, which behaviors, uh, which human behaviors with, um, were associated to, to, um, to the emergence of Chagas disease and also to the emergence of Chagas disease as a human disease in the domestic environment. And what we saw is that as soon as humans began disturbing the, the environment, first by recollecting foods and using natural resources, they began being infected. With the development of agriculture and farming, little by little, the infection began being domesticated and both the parasite and the vector began adapting to domestic spaces until there, there were variants emerging that were only domestic. And now with COVID, we all know what, what a variant means and emerging means. So I don't, need, I don't think I need to explain that, but that's what we are seeing with Chagas disease in prehistoric, in prehistoric times. Um, in North America, in in United States, that's a region that traditionally has been thought to be out of the endemic region of Chagas disease, but we have evidence, we have paleopathological evidence that people were infected with Chagas disease. And we have evidence also that triatomines were a major annoyance in all Southwest of United States. Um, with my colleagues, Carl Reinhardt, um, and Michael Fink and, and Daniel Brooks, what we identified is that there were certain practices in the Southwest of United States, like, like building open fires and chasing boot rats as primarily as for food, um, that announced the emergence of Chagas disease also in Southwest, in the Southwest of United States. Triatomines, which is which are the kissing bugs that transmit uh, Chagas disease, live um, like pre uh, live preferably in wood rats' nests. So when humans began chasing wood rats to eat them and consume them, um, they inadvertently got in touch with Chagas disease. So so like these studies giving us a perspective on on the origins of on the emergence of Chagas disease, how this emerged, how it evolved over time, and, what, and which type of human behaviors enhance Chagas disease in, in prehistoric times. And this has, a, this has very important connotations for today when we think about emerging diseases today, about the crisis of emerging diseases today. So, so we can always, as, as the paleopathology motto say, we use the past to teach the present. So, so this is a clear example of that. Um, very, very quickly, I'm gonna go with leishmaniasis, another protozoa that causes, another protozoa that causes disease. Um, it shares, it shares ecological region with, with Chagas disease. So we, we often find them together in the same region today, but also in the past. What is interesting with, uh, with Leishmaniasis is that there is, a, there is a, a type of Leishmaniasis called mucocutaneous Leishmaniasis that affects facial bones in a similar manner than leprosy can affect um, can affect uh, facial bones. So we, we also see leishmaniasis in paleopathology. And for example, Mars Teller and colleagues in 2011 found six cases, six cases of individuals with lesions that were um, consistent with leishmaniasis. When they conducted molecular analysis, they found that um, they were indeed 
um, leish, the, caused by the Leishmania protozoa. And what is interesting about that is that we can also see Leishmania being depicted in art. These are moche, moche vessels. So this, um, we not only we have paleopathology, not only we have um, ethnographic accounts from when the colonizers arrived, but we also have art talking about disease. So, so I think like very interesting to, to think about the social representation of disease in this case. So another, another way to think um, parasitic diseases. Um, as I said, uh, because uh, Leishmania and Chagas disease share ecological region, um, sometimes we find them we find them in the same individuals today, but we can also find them in, same in, in, in the same communities in the past. This paper by Martinson et al. in 2003 found from the same Chiribaya community individuals with megacolon, so with enlargement and accumulation of enlargement of the colon and accumulation of feces, and um, individuals with um, with facial disfiguration um, concordant with um, Leishmania and all that in the same community. And so again, again, thinking about the social representation, the social um, acceptance of, or the social experience of disease um, for these communities, that's a very interesting venue and a very interesting way to think um, parasitic diseases. Okay, so then let's go to our third, the third of um, the groups of parasites, helminths. Helminths are, as I said, these worm-like organisms that live inside the host and take uh, nourishment from, from the host. Um, we normally de divide them in three groups, tapeworms, flukes, and roundworms, and they are like generally classified according to their general shape. So let's look first at tapeworms. I don't know if you have ever heard about tapeworms or, or not, but they are very common today. And like very, a very common um, parasitic disease in, in many countries today, including our countries. Um, and also like, Helminths in general, tapeworms particularly, are very common in archaeological records. We find um, eggs of tapeworm quite often in archaeology. So one of the most encountered tapeworm are, are the fish tapeworm or Dibothyocephalus latus. Sorry, it's just a difficult word to pronounce. Dibo the both Eocephalus latus and Adenocephalus pacificus. These are, these are the broad fish tapeworm when Adenocephalus pacificus found um, constricted to the Pacific, to the Pacific coast of South America, and the both Eocephalus latus with a more worldwide, um, with a more worldwide uh, distribution. These uh, tapeworms are like we, we call them foodborne tapeworms because we acquire from eating raw or under, we acquire them from eating undercooked fish or raw fish. So, so finding them in archeological record not only speaks about, about um, infection, about how humans got infected and paleopathology, but it also talks about culinary practices, food ways, um, cooking foods versus eating foods raw. And that's very interesting. One of the most interesting, uh, there are many interesting papers, but one um, interesting paper was by Perry et al. came out in 2018. And they looked at Mesolithic samples. They, um, they found, they looked at a uh, refuse pit in, in a Mesolithic site in Ireland. And in that refuse pit, they found many eggs of the of fish tapeworm. I'm giving up on, on saying the, the official name. 
the Latin name of the, of the parasite. They found many eggs. And, and this was very interesting because it is thought that for Mesolithic times in Ireland, fishing was a main way of like a, a main source food. Like um, we find some, like people find um, hooks and nets, but the evidence is, is very scarce mainly because the coastal line of Ireland has changed a lot since Mesolithic times. So finding eggs of, of the fish tapeworm speaks of, of dietary, of the dietary customs of Mesolithic people, but also, as I was saying, of culinary practices. So not only were people eating fish, but they were eating raw or undercooked fish in Mesolithic times in Ireland. Um, we have, we have, I think the lattice probably is one of the, of the uh, most encountered parasites. It's a staple in the diet in many periods, in many regions in the world. We have the, the um, Divothriocephalus lattice in, in the steppe of, of uh, Russia. We have them in, in warm countries like in the Arabian Peninsula. We have them everywhere, but I thought this was a very interesting study because as they tied, as Perry and colleagues title it, it's hidden diets. And it's um, because in Ireland at that time, for that time, we don't have a lot of evidence of fishing. So this gives us yet another clue to fishing. Another staple on the diet is tinea or artinia or the beef and, and pork tapeworms. They are found everywhere as well. They have everywhere where, where, um, where agriculture and farming was practiced, we have tapeworms. But more, more than that, phylogenetic analysis tells us that we acquire tapeworms quite early on in our evolutionary history and like, it was probably our ancestors, the first ancestors that began began uh, hunting or scavenging. They were put in touch with um, tapeworms of 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 felines and tapeworms of other carnivore, and and they made themselves available as a host for tapeworms. So that we have this long evolutionary history with tapeworms. So it's so all the we find tapeworms mostly associated to farming. Um, we now know that we've been sharing evolutionary histories with tapeworms for a million years. The second of the uh, helming parasites that I want to talk about is flukes. Flukes are, tre or trematodes are leaf shaped. Um, they have these, these Funky shape. They are flatworms and they all require intermediate snails as intermediate hosts, mostly what like snails in the water. So acquiring, acquiring them normally, um, we as, as humans, we normally get them as foodborne. So when we eat, when we eat um, contaminated foods with either the, the snail or the definitive host, or we get them through broth, through the, um, when, when they enter our bloodstream. Two of the most current um, flukes are fasciolepatica or the common liver fluke, and the schistosomas. There's three types of schisto, three species of schistosoma. Here you have schistosoma hematobium or urinary blood fluke. They are extremely common today. They are listed as top neglected diseases by the World Health Organization. But unfortunately, we don't have a lot of record. We don't have a, a, a compelling record in archeology span of these two parasites. We know they probably were a major, nice, um, a major problem for prehistoric populations, but we don't see them. I think um, we have evidence of schistosoma in an Egyptian, in a Nubian mummy 
from bronze, bronze to, to Iron Age. And we have fasciola hepatica also in Neolithic samples, but, but the evidence is still very sparse. What we do have evidence for is the Chinese liver fluid. And here our colleagues in Korea have been doing amazing work at tracing, um, at tracing flux clonorchis sinensis, in particular the Chinese liver fluid from mummies from Joseon, from the Joseon um, period. And they found like four years now, I think they've been working on Joseon mummies. This is this is research led by Dr. Dong Hun Shin, by, by Min Seo. So like it's maybe 20 years of research already on, on, on Josie and mummies, and they found evidence of clonorchis sinensis of Chinese liver fluke in almost almost every period of Josie of the Josian dynasty, which spans for five centuries. And they've estimated that that throughout these five centuries, 25% of the population, so that's, that's a quarter of the population in Korea, were infected by clonorchis sinensis. So, so quite, quite an impressive, quite an impressive investigation here and, and quite a way to, to understand epidemiology in the past. Clonorchis sinensis because it's very restricted to, to the region of, of the has been oh, sorry, is it me? No. Okay, that because it has been restricted to it's restricted to East Asia. There's also archaeological reports where we see clonorchis sinensis out of this region, and that speaks of migration. For example, Carl Reinhardt identified Clonorchis sinensis among uh, um, in in a latrine in a in China. In, it was San Bernardino in San Bernardino Chinatown in California in 19th century. So that speaks of people migrating from China to to the America. And probably um, when when the big migrations of, of Chinese populations occur, and with these migrations, they also brought with them parasites. And finally, and very quickly, I want to talk about roundworms. Roundworms are definitely the most encountered parasites in archaeological record. We find we find eggs of roundworms in virtually every period, every context worldwide. And particularly, we find whipworm and giant roundworm everywhere. Whipworm is this barrel-shaped egg, while roundworm is this rounded and bubbly, um, bubbly egg. They belong to Trichuris trichura and Ascaris mumbricoides, and they are often referred as fecal borne or soil transmitted diseases because we, we acquire them by eating infected, infected soils. So it's not that people go and eat infected soils, although children do that. That's why it's very, it's very prominent in children. But if we don't have good sanitation systems, if our if we don't have sewage, uh, good sewage systems, if we don't have good hygienic, um, good hygienic habits, we can acquire these parasites. In fact, today, whipworm and brownworm infect two billion people. Right, like around the world, these are like so. This is the most prominent infection today. So we have um, whipworm and roundworm, and studies like um, large scale studies have shown that for in our past, like like this one by Flammer et al. Um, they they demonstrated that throughout medieval ages, the rate of whipworm and roundworm in Europe were similar at to, the, to today's rate. So today we're talking about 2 billion people. We're talking about 30, 40% of the population in endemic areas being infected with, with them. In the past in Europe, it was a similar picture. And not only that, but they also found tapeworms, the, 
the beef and pork tapeworm and, and the fish tapeworm also um, in high prevalence throughout the whole, the whole medieval ages. For my research, I look at 19th century North America, and this is very interesting because before the, the colonization of the Americas, whipworm and, and roundworm don't exist here. But as soon as, as the colonizers arrived, by mid 17th century, we have them virtually everywhere where, where the colonizers are in Northeast North America. And so they are very sensitive indicators of urbanization, of crowd, of crowding populations in, in, a small, in a small urban spaces. And that's exactly what I look at. In fact, I look at, at I put here three of the sites that I looked at in, in Toronto, Kingston, and Quebec City, where I'm based off. And I'm looking at neighborhoods that were densely populated by working class populations, many immigrants, and I see high rates of infection. Here you have some of the of the latrines that I that I looked at. And I have high rates of infection for both roundworm and trichura stricura. So not only these two parasites um, are talking about, about infection, about parasitism, but also they are key, key clues to urbanization. And the fact that by mid 17th century, we have them virtually everywhere is a speaking of, of sanitation systems, is speaking of hygienic habits. My samples come from 19th century, and we often find them in latrines, like everywhere. And in these latrines, funny enough, we always find also medicinal bottles, especially with remedies against worms, against, in fact, in, against parasitic worms. So people were aware that they had these infections. It's just that their sanitation systems, their hygienic habits were not, um, were not prepared to eradicate the diseases, but certainly they were aware of, the, of that they had them. So, so, that's, um, so that's very important. And I can talk more, like if you have questions about that, of course, that's my research, so, so you can ask me more, but, but I want to dedicate these last minutes of, of the course to talk about, about methods and techniques in archaeology, just because well, this is a teamwork and we like not only parasitologists need to look at parasites, but like we need to all together think about, about future research, potential research and questions that, that we have. So, so all these examples that I brought today, all these case studies with all that information, what I wanted to give you is a very general glimpse of all the, the questions that archaeoparasitology can answer. And we've seen, like we've seen, um, we talked about large scale migrations and small scale migrations. We've talked about, about origins and emergence of disease. We talked about sanitation, about hygiene. We talked about even medicine. I just mentioned the, 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 the bottles, the medicinal bottles that we find always in, in latrines in, in 19th century North America. So, so the, the broad research questions at archaeoparasitology, like, um, the broad spectrum of questions that we can ask to uh, parasitology is very interesting. And I think it should be appealing to anyone in archeology span because, because, um, because it doesn't matter what you are interested on, parasites are a potential venue to investigate that that you are interested on. So, so for me, like the question now is like, how do we get from the field to to the to this to identifying parasites and to drawing conclusions. Well, um, as I always say, and and we spoke with Natasha about that, archaeoparasitology begins in the field, not in the lab. 
And this is the same for paleopathology studies, for, for anything. We have to think about potential research before we begin an excavation. We have to think, we have to design, design methods of excavation that can help answer our questions. Even if at the moment we may not have it, but maybe in the future. So that's why I always strengthen that point. I always highlight that, that, that we need to start this research in the field. And it doesn't matter if we are looking at, at sediments or for like, in archaeology, we can we can get information from parasites from a wide of a broad variety of, of sources from from dried feces, coprolites, from mummified remains, skeletonized remains, sediments coming from latrine sediments attached to tools used for hygiene, like toilet sticks, but also sediments from refuse pits, as in the case of that I explain on the on the Ireland Mesolithic Ireland side, they obtain parasites from from a refuse pit, and also like we obtain parasites from from working areas in the house. Like many ectoparasites have been recovered from from working areas within homes in which people were were um, maybe waving, preparing clothing. Um, Forbes, uh, Forbes, I forgot her name, has a lot of interesting studies on ectoparasites and working areas. So we have to think about, we have to design our methods from the beginning. And the most important thing is first, um, avoid contamination. So always use clean tools to excavate, always use uh, or disposable, clean or disposable tools, never cross-contaminate our samples. If we are getting samples from sediment, um, for archaeoparasitology, for endoparasites, we only need about 30 to 90 milliliters of soil. So if you take just a, a, a zip bag of soil, that should suffice. But if you are do, if you are interested in ectoparasites, we should maximize the the uh, our samples and maybe take one liter two liters of sediment and we put the sediment in in a ziploc bag and we either dry it slowly in our lab or we or we don't if we don't know what to do with it let's we can freeze it we can freeze it and wait for someone to come and look at our samples if we are looking at skeletons and we are interested in getting gastrointestinal parasites, what we would, we would um, favor is the pelvic girdle. We, uh, we will need to sample the two centimeters of soil that are attached right on top of the bone, of the pelvic bones. We have to think about the composition parasites live on the intestine. So if you think about the composition and how, and how um, little by little um, all the organs are composed, we may have remains of parasites attaching to our bones or pelvic bones. So very interesting to get all these two centimeters of, of soil above the, the pelvic bones and particularly also the sacrum. Um, there's a good, a good concentration of parasites or parasite X on the sac on the sacral foramina, and so I would say, like also sample that if in the field you don't have the time, the expertise, the tools, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to do it. Another option that I give you is just take the whole pelvis, place it inside the ziplock, close it, dry it, um, I slowly dry it in the lab, leave it there, and in the lab slowly and in control conditions, excavate the soil. You don't have to do it in the field, you can do it in the lab. You can also call an archaeoparasitologist if you know one, now you know one, me, but like you can also call an archaeoparasitologist to help you, um, to help you with the excavation of, of that soil. So that should be very important. And then like for those of you that may be interested in getting into archaeoparasitology, the extraction process is the key to liberate eggs 
from sediments, either sediments that come from latrines, sediments that come from from skeletonized burials, or or sediments or the or the fossilized pieces. Those are also like we also need to liberate the eggs from from coprolites. So it's very important as well to tailor our methods to the type of sediments we have. If we have um, high calcareous sediments, we will need to get rid of all these calcareous debris. If we have organic, very organic sediments, like in the case of latrines, we probably need to get rid of the organic material to, to really concentrate um, the parasite eggs. And, and there are various techniques. I also recommend you and encourage you to consult the literature, to ask are to ask parasitologies on how to do that and how to go around um, extracting, like preparing sediments for extraction. And just because I mentioned it as well, we talked about protozoa. As I said, protozoa are not seen in an archaeological sediments. They do not, they do not preserve. So for identifying protozoa, we normally need to get and to molecular analysis or immunological analysis. For these two types of analysis, the most important thing to think about as well is avoid contamination, avoid cross-contamination. I'm sure that you all have thought about doing DNA at some point of, of your careers. And when you think about doing DNA analysis, you think about, about um, preserving your your samples from cross contamination from contamination. Same, this is the same for parasites. Pre like avoid cross contamination. And as I say, like if you have any in case of doubt, freeze your samples and and call an archaeoparasitologist, and we will happily explain um, how to go around with that. And so. With uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Natasha and IW Archaeology for inviting me to do this talk. And I am here to answer questions. Excellent, Aida. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. I, it's really great, and I, I I learn new things. It's just I really appreciate. So let's hear here. There's some question for you. You can turn on your volume, or you can just type the question, whatever you prefer. Hi, uh, I have a question. Um, I listened to. Uh, I think you might know her, Caitlin Ball. She she sounds. I think she also did um, archaeoparasitology um research on some north american stuff but anyway my question is how does prevalence of let's say um you know the protozoa that doesn't occur in archaeological uh samples how does that lack of those species skew our uh understanding of prevalence of parasites in the composition and proportions of parasites in archaeological data and the second question is what is the uh best timeline or the period from which you are most successful in extracting uh parasite evidence thank you thank you Anush. um well um to the first question evidence um of course it is skewed the fact that that we need to to um, to apply other techniques to identify protozoa, um, it's it's a problem. It's a problem for for us. But um, we are beginning to more and more apply um, molecular analysis to identify to identify them. There are so many, like in the last five four years, so many papers that ha have come out. With um, with implementation of uh, metagenomic techniques, um, PCR, all all this type of molecular um, analysis that we have available to identify uh, protozoa from from the sediments. So Mitchell has done 
a lot of that in Europe, same with Mathieu Levely. Um, and they are doing a, a great job in trying to trace this, the, the, the history of these gastrointestinal parasites that we normally don't see. So there's papers about, about um, amebiasis, papers about, about um, like, what else, um, lots of uh, GR. The, so this, this have been identified. Of course, we need to keep implementing them. It's a matter of money uh, and expertise. As Natasha said at the beginning, we are like a handful of, of archaeoparasitologists only. So that's that's a problem. Um, but it's but of course, if we don't do it, it is skewed, the analysis. And to your second question, there's no preference. We, we find parasite remains from all type of sediments. Maybe the sediments that are more difficult are the sediments that are um, that have a, 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 a neutral, no, not a neutral, uh, um, the, the, the high pH, the, um, like calciums, like sediments that have been in, that have high percentage of calcium, for example, are not good for, for, for our parasites. But sediments that are highly acidic are excellent for parasite X, for example. So sometimes um, acidic sediments, acidic sediments do not preserve skeletons, but can preserve uh, parasite X. So that's another way to explore paleopathology that we don't have. And it doesn't matter the time frame. We have we have parasite evidence from everywhere in the world, all time periods. So, uh, <laughs> if I may, uh, to, hi, hi. <laughs> so I would like to thank Natasha for organizing this uh, this uh, uh, series of webinars on uh, this interesting lecture, which uh, I uh, uh, present today. It's very important, I think, uh, especially in the our region. Natasha is well known for the Central Balkan region and for studying bioarchaeology in, in this geographical region from um, not only in, 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 um, pre in um, um, Holocene, but also in uh, Pleistocene is Paleolithic is also very important for understanding para parasitic infections. Um, and uh, it, it, just one consultation actually for Aida, uh, if I understand well, uh, for example, there is a lot of different um, approaches, methodological approaches to studying para parasites in different schools of archaeoparasitology or paleoparasitology. Uh, so, uh, if I understand well, so your is one of the of the methods, and I also saw the difference in the French school in in in, in the Cambridge school, for example. So. It's various, but more or less uh, all uh, methods, uh, all protocols in, in the fields and in the labs are more or less the same. So it would be just the preference of uh, not say taste, but preference of possibilities to apply a particular method. Yes, um, I think um, it is. It would be it would be fantastic to to have unified methods and to to because then would be clearly comparable. But the key to our methods is just the extraction. The key of an extraction method, I think um, is what I was mentioning before, like we have to think about the type of sediment that we have. This is, this is the foremost question, like because um, we need to adapt our methods to, to our sediments. Like not all methods work for the same sediments. So the, um, this is a key question. And then for our methods to talk, to say that they are efficacious, they need to, one, release the eggs, two, release the eggs in optimum conditions so we can identify them. Because we do identification through morphology of the egg. If we change the morphology of the egg um, because of our, of our laboratory methods, that is a problem. That is a problem. Um, there are some methods that that um, are better at identifying a more wide range of parasites, but they don't. But but they don't give us. Um, they are not quanti quantitative, so we cannot draw conclusions 
um, about the epidemiology in the past. We cannot draw conclusions about which groups were more affected. We, so, so that's that's uh, an, a disadvantage. So yes, we can maybe we can see a couple of more spe species than with other methods, but we cannot do quantification. Um, my method, my methods, we, because I don't use a single one. Like I, I play with it. I mix, I mix acids, um, extraction with acids and and sieving. I sieve my methods. Parasites are highly, parasite eggs are highly, highly resistant to acids. Their, their shells are super resistant. So other than bleach, almost all other acids can go through parasites without damaging, without damaging them. And this is fantastic because we can use these acids to get rid of organic materials. We can use acids to get rid of silicates, to carbonates, etc. And then we can have a clean, a clean, um, like um, yes, uh, slide. <laughs> and the advantage of this is that we can also do quantification. So I'm, I'm very, very pro the methods I used, of course, because I think like it gives. It gives me good results in terms of, of cleaning my samples and preserving the morphology of the of the parasites intact, but also it allows me to quantify to do quantification. And if I can do that, I can compare any sample I have. If I can quantify, it doesn't matter if I'm looking at, at a 19th century latrine from Northeast North America, or if I'm looking at 17th century refuse pit from New Orleans, which I'm also looking at, because my method, at, because being quantifi quantifiable allows us to compare. So I think like that would be one of the questions and, and mainly preservation of the morphology. So uh, you recommend to, to, in any case, use at least 10% uh, of the acid um, uh, I use, for example, acid only in the case of uh, mineralized uh, samples, because <laughs> there is no other uh, uh, possibility to release eggs. Uh, uh -huh. But generally from the pelvic sediments, I try uh, some uh, number of uh, pelvic sediments, uh, only by um, trisodium phosphate, uh, uh, 0.2 or trisodium phosphate, uh, without acid, for example, and okay. I also have very uh, good uh, result uh, with very releasing eggs without any debris sticking into into mm -hmm. into them. So, um, no, it works. In fact, for for most coprolite analyses, um, only only rehydrating them with trisodium phosphate and then filtering filtering them, it's enough. Like. Uh, but this is not the case for many other type of sediments. So I could not do that with latrine sediments because they are mm. full of, um, of debris. Let me, um, can I go and share again? Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can share again this with you. Um, can you see my screen now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is this comes from a latrine, um, mm -hmm. latrine in New Orleans that I've been analyzing. Here we have we have laser point. We have mm -hmm. eggs of whipworm, eggs of scaries, but then we have pollen. There's a rotifer, which is an organism that lives in wet environments. We have this is a, a mandible of an insect. We have so many debris, and this is after cleaning. If I don't clean that, our eggs get trapped in all these debris, and they don't get released. So I, for me, for this type of sediments, I need to, I need to mandatory use acids to clean to clean. Well, mandatory. Like if I want good good results, I need to clean my my sediments with acids. For that, I do use um, hydrochloric acid, and I don't use hydrofluoric acid, which is one of the methods um, most like like in America. Um, the school that Carl Reinhardt started uses hydrochloric acid and hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is super hazardous, super contaminant, very dangerous to use, 
um, I don't want that responsibility on me. And, and also I think we have to start thinking about our methods. Um, we have to start thinking about the environment. And so, so I want to, like I eliminated the hydrofluoric acid from my samples, but now I use hydrochloric acid. I use um, sometimes if my samples are not are not uh, hydrated, I use trisodium phosphate. I use the flocculants. The flocculants help separate clay particles, so I use the flocculants. I use micro sieving to get clay particles um, sieved away, by, but not the parasites. I think. Um, we, we wrote that in one paper with Carl Reinhardt like a couple of years ago on methods. We think that one of the problems with some of the methods that come from the Cambridge School is that they use a set of micro sieves to sieve the to sieve the um, the parasites, and I think um, that damages the outer shell of the parasite. Probably the mechanical. Um, the mechanical force exercised by the sieves um, breaks the mm -hmm. outer shell of the parasite. So I thought, mm -hmm. um, I think I, by eliminating the, the middle sheep, the middle sieves, and just using a very tiny 15 micrometers sieve to get rid of the, of the clay. Clays, clay particles are between 15 micrometers and five micrometers. So, and parasites are always larger, bigger than 15 micrometers. So, so they they are not seed, and they don't go through this through the through the um, the metallic um, mm. mesh. So I think that preserves very well the apparent the morphology of parasite. This is this is um, what I think it's going on with some of the of the methods. I think they use too many seeds, mm. and this mechanical damage. While uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yes. 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 You. You, you were very thorough. <laughs> thorough. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you, Manjo. Uh, we, we will catch up uh, uh, later on and and discuss yes. maybe a little bit more about some of these uh, detail of my method email. methodological yeah. issues. So, <laughs> so thank yes. you once again for thank for you. this lab. Thank you for uh, attending. Thanks. Thanks, Nemanja. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. And did you have a question uh, in the chat? Um... Um, I think Anush asked me if I'm going to the ethnobiology conference in June. I am not going to the ethnobiology conference. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Too bad. I mean, that would have been so, so great and relevant, really, you know, to ethnobiology. I don't, I mean, um, I don't know if you remember. Uh, I am the... not a member, in fact, no. But I, I follow the, the work and I see like papers that come out from the conferences and it's very interesting. Um, like I, I've been using a lot of the resources that come out from that. For example, the last picture I show you with all the little um, different micro remains that are not parasites. Um, I think um, this is very useful, but I'm in Quebec. It's uh, like... It's a struggle to to make it to all conferences. Too bad. I mean, it would have been. It would. I think it would have been great. <laughs> and and your research is so relevant, really, uh, for all, so many applications. Like right now, like I can't listen to you for hours, and I wish <laughs> that there would be um, more of a. I don't know, maybe a course or um, you know s something that. Um, because you are synthesizing the information, you know, versus me going digging through the literature. Uh -huh, so, yes. so, so that is that is so much more helpful. So thank yeah, you yeah. very much. Thanks, thanks. I, I, I that was my thought. I, I hope that, um, like, with this broad perspective I gave you, like, all of you got an idea, like here and there, like that I touch almost everyone's interest when talking about archaeology. Um, and also, like just just as a reference, um, I do my like I not only I don't only do parasitology, but I also do palynology. So with the same samples and with the same methods, I get also pollen out of of sediments. So like this complements the information that we get from parasites in terms of, like for example when we are talking about culinary culinary and dietary 
and dietary issues. So, so yes, of course, um, I would like to attend a ethnobiology conference. I think it, it would help me too. But uh, when is a course coming out or a book <laughs> or something? <laughs> well, we have various articles out. Um, and I'm, I'm always thinking about different, like I'm in the middle of writing a, a, another methods paper where I talk about a little bit the issues that Nemania has, has raised about um, methods and, and type of micro remains we, we can obtain. Like I'm, I have all these ideas, but um, it's, it's always a lot of work. <laughs> yes. Uh, because I was uh, years ago, I was interested in neuroparasitology of how parasites mm -hmm. affect behavior and yes. how, and because behavior on a larger scale, like the story of the discovery of taxoplasmosis mm -hmm. and how taxoplasma, uh, you know, affects. And um, because my interest is forensic veterinary science. So okay. anything that has to do with animal remains or any kind mm -hmm. of, um, you know, osteology mainly, but uh, parasites is. Uh, you know, it's it's really special. Um, yes. So, so anyway, so that's kind of like another way of looking at people's behavior patterns by mm -hmm. looking by by connecting to what parasites you find in the evidence in archaeological evidence. Yes. So, but yes, anyway, um, I I got your email. So. Yeah, we we should we should talk because because this is very interesting and I I'm. I'm like, I would love to hear more about this. Me too. I'm like, I'm so excited. As I said, like, I could listen to you forever. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much. Thanks. And yeah, if you're not on our email list, just you can just send us the, the email and uh, so we can inform you and also exchange uh, the information about lectures and courses and so on. And I just wanted to ask a really very practical thing. Uh, for example, you told us that uh, if we if we find samples and uh, we can just freeze them. So, yes. for example, I want to work with you and I have my stuff in freezer, right? And I want to send to you, but it's going to def defrozen in the meantime. Yes. So how is it going yes, like that? Then, then you'll need to dry them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an issue with international shipping, uh, probably. Yeah. Um, but um, with all shipping, in fact, with frozen material, but um, you can dry them. To dry, um, I rather prefer just to start drying parasites, but I, I like samples rather than freeze them. But I say always freeze because it's a simple solution for, for archaeologists that don't know yet what to do with, with that sediment. And that may be thinking that in the future is useful, but they don't know yet, so freeze them. But if you have um, a control atmosphere like a fume hood or an oven, an archaeological oven where you can slowly dry your your parasite at at regular temperature at a, a like regular temperature twenty five degrees twenty eight degrees no more like slowly dry them and and then and then they are ready to be shipped and store for like they can store forever. Like mm -hmm. my first analysis, my first paper that we wrote on methods were um, sediments from 1980s that had been dried and in Carl Reinhardt's lab for for since 1980s. So like they can preserve very mm -hmm. well and, and it's easy. And uh, if you don't have the, this uh, oven, then is it possible just to dry them on uh, like ambiental temperature or anything like that? Yes, and how long it takes, for example? How do you it know when it's how, completely dry? It depends how wet you are. Like one thing that I discovered being here in Quebec, being in this in this country where it's frozen for four months out of, of the 12 months of the year, and then the freezing and everything is that they are very, very wet. So um, when we take samples from a latin, it may take up to five, six days to dry it at mm -hmm. level temperature under, under a fume hood. Maybe, okay. uh, maybe I can share my experience with, uh, with yes, of uh, course. Uh, preservation of the samples because uh, when I apply the sampling in the, in the field, the, the, the colleagues, they just um, proceed the sampling and 
and the, and in my lab came a lot of, of samples. So I first was to actually to dry them to preserve them for the further analysis because if we put them in uh, like in the wet condition and storage in the plastic bags for a um, few months, mm -hmm. it would be I assume <laughs> uh, not 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 good good practice. So I first uh, took the samples and put in petri dishes and. Uh, Three to six days is the optimum uh, time for drying okay. on, on the room temperature. Uh, yeah. I also look through a lot of literature, um, uh, not only for archaeology but also for general for soil science, uh, mm -hmm. how to to preserve it and the best way use an oven, uh, freezer, and lots of other possibilities. But it seems that the the natural uh, slowly drying is the best way. Uh, for preserving not only for the parasite but also for the uh, microbiological well, remains. Yes, for pollen and, and, and everything. I think the same, like an oven, I recommend it, like what I say is 25 degrees, 28 maximum. Um, and I recommend mm. oven to avoid contamination. So for example, in, in working archaeological, like in, in an archaeology labs where people are working with sediments, where like cleaning bones or cleaning artifacts or things, it may be if you don't have a fume hood, it may be interesting to put it inside an oven, close the oven and leave it there. 25 degrees, not more. Then if it's closed at 25 degrees in, in three days, it should like, like you should check every day, but like in three days, it should be done. Um, but yeah, like I, I dry them outside under a fume hood. I close the fume hood and I leave them there like you for five, six days. But, but it's another possibility, like dry it in, in the oven. And then another thing that I haven't mentioned is that if your samples are very wet when you take them out from the field, it may be interesting to add a few drops of ethanol or formalin um, because, because um, fungal, fungal um, explosion is, is something like that occurs in a matter of hours. So suddenly you have all this micellar, like uh, this tiny micellar, like network so, like, of, of, um, of like fungal, like going over your samples and, and they are difficult to get rid of. In yeah, fact, because, because you, you don't get from, rid of, the, of, of fungal spores. The um, best way actually- More resistant than, than <laughs> parasites. <laughs> I think actually the um, especially in the, in the case of uh, pellet sediments, because you can also, as you said, uh, study and looking through uh, micro botanical remains and also uh, to fungal species. Yes. And yes. you can and you can have this uh, modern contamination if you you leave uh, wet samples for. Uh, as you said, yes. from, from a couple the, hours to 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 couple of days. So yeah, it would be. I think the the worst that you can do is leave um, the samples wet. Mm. Dry, like take them and begin drying them straight away. Like and when the the field day finishes, take your samples, take them into the lab, put them under a film hood, and begin drying them. Um, or freeze them because if you leave them for for days in a in a plastic bag wet this is going to be like and you're gonna see it you're gonna see suddenly this white uh, this white like uh, um, yeah. growing on your soil yeah, yeah that definitely the first step is to preserve them for uh, yes for not only for the next uh, month or or but for for as you said for 10 or 15 years later yes. because from those from those samples you can provide the molecular and uh, immunological uh, analysis uh if you if you only do in in the first uh, round uh, uh microscopical one yeah but if you can have possibility in, in the future for for uh, additional analysis then it's very uh, convenient to have a uh, very good preserved uh, samples so yeah <laughs> exactly i coincide with everything you say so yes so any other question i mean i'm always available on email mm -hmm. like i'll be happy to share any of the studies i've introduced here my work anything like 
all very shareable. I mean, we are we are we are a handful of people. <laughs> we have to share. Okay, there is no more questions, or you maybe will have some later, but um, you can always contact Aida. And I would really like to thank you for this amazing lecture. And uh, well, hopefully, this is just the first step. I hope uh, yeah. we will continue on uh, with more, more, more lectures like this. Yeah, thank you, Natasha. It was a fantastic opportunity. Like I'm always happy to talk about parasites, and as I say, no better way to spend your Saturday than looking. At <laughs> I like when you said you're just drying your parasites. <laughs> like, what are you doing? I'm laughing. I'm drying my, drying my parasites. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, for being here, and thanks, Natasha. Thank you, Thank you so much. It was very bye -bye. Thank you bye -bye. so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.